Uh, thank you for introducing me. Thank you to GovZero for inviting me to Taiwan. It's my first time in Taiwan, so thank you all. Uh, my presentation is going to be about open data in Myanmar's 2015 election. And it's going to be a little bit technical. How many people here are programmers or coders? Okay, so it'll be good for programmers and coders and non-coders. Uh, uh, so, Mingalaba is how we say hello in Myanmar. Uh, is anyone here uh, connected to Myanmar, knows any language? Yes, I think we talked about that. Uh, so, uh, about how I got involved in Myanmar, I work for the Asia Foundation. We're an international NGO. Uh, this is their mission statement, but essentially they have offices in several countries in Asia, usually developing countries, and are working on democracy, human rights, disaster planning, or disaster response planning. Uh, and there have been some connections in Taiwan, but we don't have an office here. Uh, Within Asia Foundation, it's a big organization, there are only four of us in this digital media and technology program. Uh, so it's my boss, a researcher, another programmer, and me. Uh, and whenever one of our country offices has a project that gets kind of technical, they invite us to come in and be like consulting on the higher end technology projects. About Myanmar, uh, I've been told in Mandarin, it's Mian Tian. Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay. No another word. Okay. Uh, it's a country in Southeast Asia with um, 53 million people, population. Uh, in English, uh, sometimes called Burma. Uh, in this talk, because we worked with the government, I will use the, the word Myanmar, as does BBC and The Guardian. Uh, if you have questions about that, we can talk about it later. Uh, and we were interested in Myanmar because the 2015 election is the first openly contested national election in the country in 25 years. So for many people, it would be their first time voting. Uh, so everyone knew it was coming, and it was going to be very significant, and the Asia Foundation had been just moved back to Myanmar and wants to be part of opening up the country and embracing new technology. Uh, it's interesting, the previous talk was about the Indonesia election. Uh, before I started at the Asia Foundation, uh, they did a project in Indonesia in the same election uh, called Pemilu, and they created a database of all of the candidates in Indonesia. And after that uh, project was successful, the government started doing that work on their own. So we want this project to inspire us in how we work in Myanmar. So we asked uh, the local office. They have decided to call it Me Peso, which means let's vote. And we decided our aim is to create a database of all of the candidates, all of the political parties, and then if there are other data sets by other organizations that's useful for us, then we'll include them as well. Uh, and we don't want to create one app and say, download our app, and we know what we, you want. Instead, we make it a hackathon. We make it a competition. So the local developers and local designers will use their own creativity and their own knowledge to create the perfect app or many apps for Myanmar. If we're going to get data about the election, we need to create a partnership with the Myanmar government. So we worked with the Union Election Commission. This is their office. Uh, they are based in Naypyidaw, which is the new capital of Myanmar. And so this is their office. Uh, before I joined the Asia Foundation, they did the higher level talks and decided they want the election to be very open, they want to embrace the new technology, and also they want digital records of their own because in the past everything has been on paper. Nipida is uh, an unusual place to work. 
uh, became the capital just 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, many of the buildings have kind of a similar form. If you look at this building and this previous building, I think they have the same blueprint but different design. You see a lot of the same structure there. Uh, but I think there's some very sensational articles in the news that make it seem like an uh, unusual place. But in fact, you know, there's a market, there are people there. Uh, I think we were really happy to work with the people there. So the data that we would receive would all be on paper. We need to digitize everything. Many people are even writing their form in pen or pencil. Uh, and at the time, we did not know how many people would apply to be a candidate. So we didn't know what we should do. So we hired uh, 20 people, students, to do the digitizing, really just typing. And we would go between 10 and 20 people over the course of the project. Um, in Myanmar, in this election, there were 6,072 candidates who qualified and 91 political parties. Um, but most of them are regional parties. So on your ballot, you might see six or seven. So each candidate has filled out uh, this form, which is called form number six. And uh, I've been asked to censor this candidate's information. But you can see in the middle, there's part where by pen they've written their, they have a bachelor's degree. Uh, and so these forms would be, and they also have a photo in the top right. So we would receive this data and start going through them. So it has their name. Uh, the area that they will represent in Congress, their personal address, their personal voter registration, uh, education, occupation, religion, ethnicity, and also information about their parents. Uh, for some candidates, the area that they represent, uh, they did not fill out correctly. Uh, they're smart people, but it's a new election process, so many people didn't know what to write. So we have to do some error checking when we receive these paper forms. We also need to decide, we're digitizing everything for the, local, for the government, but we also need to decide what is public interest. We're going to create a public database, an API, for everyone in the country. Uh, we decided that the candidates and parents' bio information is useful and culturally appropriate for this. Uh, we decided not to share uh, their national ID number or any personal contact information. That was just for the government office. So many people ask me, why are we doing typing? Like, why are we not using a computer tool called OCR? Uh, and so at the time, this didn't even exist, uh, Myanmar language OCR. Um, later, Google would create a OCR tool, which you can see here. On the top, you have what we have scanned. And on the bottom, it's done the typed part OK. But as soon as it starts seeing this guy's handwriting, it starts thinking it's Arabic. It really does not know what this guy wrote. So we really need a local student who can read the handwriting, because I don't know what that is either. Um, so that they can input that into the program. So at first, we would get black and white faxes uh, sent from all the parts of the country. We would ask two people to type the information. And then if there's any difference in what they typed, then it'll be compared to each other. I think that makes sense. Uh, and then over time, we got the actual forms. Just buckets of paper would come in from different regions. Uh, one region was affected by a flood, so their bucket came in very late. Uh, but every candidate, we scan them, we ask two ca people to type them, and then we do this comparing step. Uh, the app for creating this, uh, we built ourselves. Uh, I've used uh, JavaScript language, Node.js server, and the Express framework. Our uh, database is... Oh, there we go. Okay. 
I'll read it and then we'll see if it comes back. Yeah. Database is a SQLite database uh, using some different tools here that I've listed to build the app. And because of the nature of our work, we were asked to work offline inside of the ministry office. So we, ahead of time, we purchased a Windows server. We installed all the software on it in Yangon. Then we drove it to Nepida and installed it offline. Uh, we use a network drive to transfer any new code or images on and off of this server. So everything is completely separate from the internet. Uh, the interface that they see is very similar to this. Uh, they see the form and then one by one they fill out those fields in the web browser. So they would have 20 laptops all connected to our server. Here's a screenshot of where you compare two answers. Uh, in this one, there's just a slight difference of a dash or a hyphen in the two responses. So most of them are very easy. They don't even need to see the original form to find out what is the typo. Uh, then also each form has a face. We used an uh, OpenCV tool to extract the face from every scanned form. And so all of those are included in our public database as well. And on the way, we're writing some new code. And I asked the Asia Foundation for permission. We open sourced our work. So uh, in Myanmar, Burmese language, they use their own numerals, their own numbers. So we've open sourced a library, a JavaScript library, to convert those. And also operations involving names, moving the prefix, like Mr., uh, sorting them alphabetically, uh, matching names, uh, finding common errors. Uh, this one is important because we had all of the candidates' names that people entered, and then all of the official names. And I realized we had the largest database of Burmese typos ever created. So I did some statistics on what are the most common mistakes. And if you can see those letters there, they're very similar letters that handwritten people would often make the mistake. One thing that we didn't solve with technology was the Myanmar calendar. Uh, it's a lunar calendar, uh, similar to your calendar, the traditional calendar, but different. Uh, right now it's the year 1,377 in Myanmar. Uh, most people gave us their birth date in the standard calendar, but older candidates would often give us their traditional birth date, and that's, it's their country, so it makes sense. Um, so we couldn't find a JavaScript library for this, so we went to the store and bought an astrology book, if you can believe it, and uh, that's how we were translating their birth date. Finally, we received the official ballot list. Uh, it's kind of collected separately from our work, just showing the names and areas that people will represent in Congress. One-fifth of people gave us data in Unicode format, but 80% gave it to us in this font, which, if you have the font, it does look like Burmese language. Uh, but if you don't have the font, it looks like just ASCII text. I don't know if you can see it well here. But uh, other organizations advised us that this was completely useless and that we would never be able to compare it to our own data. But I had actually thought it was pretty cool to learn about Burmese language. So we started working on a library to convert it. So uh, this is the word Myanmar in Burmese language. and the way words work is they are syllables and they make combinations. So it's mia, n, ma. So they have, it's kind of hard to explain quickly, but if you have questions later, but it basically, to make this three syllable or three part word, you have six uh, characters. And in the researcher font, you can't just replace one English letter with one Burmese letter, because sometimes they type them in a different order. Like the one that looks like a left bracket, uh, they like to type first, 
because it is to the left. So we have to have many regular expressions to move everything around and fix it. So this we released as an open source JavaScript module. And we also helped a local project called Rabbit Converter uh, with a similar uh, translation issue. So we're very excited because the election is coming. People start to put up posters. This woman is running as an independent candidate. Uh, independent candidates get to choose their own logo. She is kind of like a, one of those Russian eggs kind of thing as her logo. Thought it was interesting. Um, so everyone's very excited. Uh, it's time to launch the hackathon. So in Myanmar, there is a co-working hacker space called Pandyar. And that was the perfect place to host it. We got everyone together, and it was the largest event ever held at Pandyar. They uh, had to buy more chairs just for us. And uh, we told them our plan is to have a hackathon that is two weeks long. So I think most people are used to having like one day or one weekend as their hackathon. But we wanted to train people ahead of time we wanted to explain everything in detail. And we wanted to give people a total of three weekends to work on it. So if you have two week long session, you get three weekends. Even doing this, we had people sleeping overnight, doing an all nighter. I did it once. Um, but I think this sends the wrong message to people that we say in order to be a real hacker, you have to sleep on a beanbag chair and be uncomfortable. Because I think it's, it's, it's fun, and this team did really well. But I think it scares away many of our potential developers. Uh, Myanmar is a very traditional culture. And we knew that many of the women who were coding on the project are living with their parents and are expected to go home. And so it's actually very sexist to have an all-nighter hackathon, if you think about it. So this quote, it's not like I didn't talk to this person even. This is from one of our developers, Po Po Min Sui. She says, this, week, this hackathon took two weeks, unlike previous challenges. So everyone got a fair play and well enough time. And that was like, that's what I was trying to do. So I feel pretty good about this response. Also, in the middle of the hackathon, people had questions. Uh, can the federal district vote in the Senate and House elections? Can, uh, is a senator more powerful than a House representative? These are questions that might seem kind of unusual to you because you know how it works in your country. But in Myanmar, the Constitution is only about five or six years old. So these people were in school and learned about the government before the new constitution was written. So they're asking questions from a Burmese expert who can explain everything and make sure that their app will be accurate. Two weeks later, there's the final presentations. Uh, this is one of the teams that presented. Uh, we had 137 people participating. These are our youngest participants. I think they're like 12. So they're going to take all of our jobs, I think. Uh, anyway, there's uh, 23 teams that made it to the final presentations. And like I said before, it was the largest event ever. So we were really happy with how this turned out. The uh, winner of the challenge is called M Voter 2015. This is the team here. And this is their app. It shows the candidate, their political party. You can you know, look up any district in the country, and that information will come from our database. Uh, we don't just promote one app. We also promote the second and third place finishers. Uh, one feature that we really liked, on the right side, they have a sample ballot, like a preview ballot. And it's a game where they say, mark the ballot where you would put the stamp. 
And it's important because if you put the stamp over the person's name or the party symbol, then it will invalidate your vote. So the game is like a little reminder, like, don't screw this up. Like, uh, here's how you vote correctly. There was another team that had an interesting idea. They did a data visualization, which you see here. Uh, they received an honorable mention. And I thought it was interesting how they were able to compare different political parties, like which parties had younger participants, which parties had uh, Muslim candidates from the minority groups in Myanmar. And here are two app reviews that we got. Uh, they're not perfect English, but I understand completely. Um, one is, thank you so much, dear developers. Your brilliant application helped me a lot, explaining to my parents how and who to vote. And the other one is, you have saved the entire country. Thanks to you so much for my younger brothers. Keep on create your dream. So our developer team was very happy to receive these reviews from their colleagues. So then uh, I left the country. We did our launch one month ahead of the election. So people would have time to use the app and promote it. Uh, on election day, the lines were very long. People were very excited. Uh, fortunately, it was a peaceful election. And the winner of the election was the opposition party called NLD with the leader Aung San Suu Kyi who had previously won the Nobel Peace Prize. So, um, let me adjust this, okay. So people were pleased with the outcome of the election. Uh, our stats, on election day, we had over 1,181 users at any time on Google Analytics. The top app, we believe, has 211,000 downloads. Other apps were downloaded as well. We didn't do so good of a job collecting statistics. Uh, requests to the API came from almost 300 of 330 townships. So there's some areas that are very remote and people don't have smartphones yet. That's understandable. Uh, but many areas, most areas, received requests. So we think either uh, people made the request themselves, or for relatives back home, they were able to use our service to answer questions about the election. Another thing about this that's why it's so successful for us is in Myanmar, it's uncommon to use the Google Play Store. Uh, people don't have credit cards or digital payment. So typically, they install an app at the phone store or if they know someone, they can download it over USB cable. Uh, so we ask them to download it directly from several different websites. And over time, that caught on. People were telling each other. Or there's an app where you can share it from one phone to the other over Bluetooth, I think. So what's the future for civic tech in Myanmar? Is this going to succeed? I think it's very bright future for civic tech. Uh, many people were interested in participating and having more hackathons in the future. Uh, the country is opening up and the economy is changing. Uh, many developers are there, though many of them now, um, one person we work with very closely, Yi Lanong, he has moved to Singapore for, you know, it's more opportunities in Singapore now, but if the economy can change, then talented developers will stay in the country. Uh, and that winning team that I showed you, M Voter 2015, the average age of the teammates is 18 years old. So they are, they haven't even finished college yet. So they have a lot that they can learn and do in that time. In the future, uh, for our own thoughts, uh, we would like to include Mandalay. There's another city in Myanmar called Mandalay where we know other developers are working. So we could have included them. Uh, we should have done more coordination with, there's a group in Myanmar called Geek Girls Myanmar. We asked them to promote our event to improve our diversity. 
but we could have done more to coordinate with them and co-host events. Um, we also think in the new environment, there's this uh, more ability for these civic tech apps to be promoted by candidates and parties and students. In our case, we did not want to reach out too much to any one political party to make it not, so we didn't want to seem too biased. Uh, in the future, when there's more freedom of the press, perhaps it is easier for these groups to promote the app and us to share it with them. All right, thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Today, if you have any question, if you want to discuss with Nicholas, if you can meet on the hallway or you have another conversation. Yes, let's meet in the hallway, and and even if uh, you need help with translating it, Kiki, are you still here? <laughs> she may help me with the understanding your question if you have trouble translating it. Great. Okay, but yeah. So maybe see you later. Okay. Right. Thank you.